All right. So this will be part two of the videos on populism. Here I'm going to go over two videos you know, on the hills rising with Crystal and Sagar. And my point here is to... Fuck, I don't even know which, which order I want to share these in. I guess we'll go over their response, and then I'll give you a demonstration of why it's ridiculous and how she should respond to this. First of all, I think it's ridiculous that she's the one who puts on... I, I watched like half of this, uh, I think a little over half of it in double speed. Um, she's doing most of the defense here. Why are you defending... A right-wing populist he is a mouth he is the co-host on your show you do not need to defend him he is not your employee let him speak for himself this is my main issue that i've always had with saga like i watched this show like a few times and what saga usually does is he'll make fun of people like what um the thing is people like don't realize it because when saga talks he says nothing of interest you generally don't get a whole lot of him saying the things that he thinks or what he believes or how the world should go you'll hear him bashing joe biden bashing corporate democrats talking about like well vague things that uh left-leaning populists will generally agree upon and that's most of what he talks about here um what i the other video i have focuses on him talking about a thing where most left-leaning populists would disagree with him on and explaining and like we'll go over that and you'll just see how transparently ridiculous is. i did a small segment of about immigration in the previous video but like he goes on a whole well the whole sorry the whole thing's on immigration but like how he manipulated data to try and say like most people don't support immigration which is clearly absurd um or at the very least that was not supported by the data that he presented like why put that graph on a fucking screen if that wasn't meant to prove your point because like it clearly didn't prove his fucking point um whatever so um let's play this story hitler so and mussolini that's having equated fake populists like trump and outright <sighs> genocidal fascists like hitler with right-wing populism he has a okay you can't call trump a fake populist at least from the paradigm of saying that mussolini is a real populist or hitler is a real populist trump did the same thing that these people did. You say, oh, I'm going to help you. I'm going to fix it. We're going to, like, you know, punish the bad people. Immigrants are raping and blah, 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 blah. Like, that's right-wing populism. That's what it is. And, like, when you look at fascistic movements and you read, like, history books on them or whatever, you'll see that they say things like, we're going to improve the working class and, you know, fuck the elites and all that. And then when push comes to shove, what do they do? They cozy up with capitalists, they cozy up with business owners, and they, they work with them in state and form some sort of like corporatism where these elites, keep in mind, they don't have a problem with elites. They just think we should be the elites. Now, the people who are at the top of society, that's their in-group. So they partner with those people to do things. You can't call Trump a fake populist when he uses populist rhetoric, um, when he uses popular re rhetoric to get in power, continues using that populist rhetoric, and then cozies up with like fucking rich people and does like the bidding of uh the elites if you want to call them that um because that's right-wing fucking populism that's what it does either none of the shit is you want to call it illegitimate populism but like sure whatever because they're not actually serving the people's interests but it's like just a mode of politics and if it's a mode of politics he's doing it he's just not actually fighting for the people when push comes to shove but that's right-wing populism i don't know why she's just groundwork all laid right. to come to this ultimate conclusion that the left should have absolutely nothing to do with anyone who calls themselves a right populist as of course Sagar does so here is the concluding paragraph the age-old labor question is which side are you on Carlson, Ingetti, Trump, Bolsonaro, they answer that question emphatically and openly. They are not on our side. They would use the might of the state against us. Right-wing populism is simply a lie, and nobody who is on the left should have anything to do with it. First, I think it's important to clarify what the mission of the show is, since Nathan sort of seems to mischaracterize what we're doing here in the first place. We're not pretending that we agree on everything and joining hands and singing kumbaya. If you've been watching this show, especially in recent weeks, Yet here she is spending two minutes of this opening video, and she will continue defending Sagar. Not herself. She, from what I, I, I skimmed most of the article, she's not really under attack. He's talking about how right-wing populism is cancer, and he's right. That entire ending paragraph that he just read is 100% correct. Yes, they're not on your side. Now, what she's about to get into, because I already watched part of this video, is how, oh, like, should we not work with them? Well, no, like, if they want to vote to, t if, if, like, let's say you have, I don't know, some jackass in the Senate, some right-wing jackass in the Senate who wants to um, vote for increasing taxes on the rich, sure, we can vote for increases on the taxes of the rich. 
you can do that. That doesn't mean you agree with them. It doesn't mean you defend them on all their other nonsense. It just says, hey, in this instance, we voted on a thing to achieve the thing that we both wanted to do for different reasons, but we, we voted for the same bill, whatever. Anything. But, like, that that's not, like, playing apologetics and playing defense like she's doing right now. It's it's just like, yeah, in working with them, sure, I, we can vote on things we both agree on, but that doesn't mean I'm going to sit here and pretend like, oh, right-wing populism, that's really great. Just like when a libertarian's like, let's not go to war. And I'm going to be like, yeah, 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 that's great. And I also think it's rude to attack them for wanting to, for calling taxation theft and saying we should defund the whole welfare state. Like, I don't feel the need to defend a libertarian on wanting to defund the welfare state just because we agreed that we shouldn't be in a war in Iraq and Afghanistan. Like, duh. You don't need to do that. You can just vote for the bill with them, say like, cool, we did that. It was a good thing, and then you move on. You don't need to, like, harp on how, like, we're in an alliance. Because you're not. It's not an alliance. We're not working together in any meaningful way. We don't share re even remotely enough goals in, in line. We share tangential things that we reach borderline coincidentally, to be fucking honest. Um, which is what motivates them to work together. That, like, coincidentally we land on the same thing on this one issue. Like, I, I would have no issue as someone who's, like, fairly left-leaning working with either socialists or social democrats or like i guess even centrists because like i would have a fair amount in common with them to where i'm like yeah i'm not going to actively attack you but like saga and jetty i have like nothing in common with this person apart from wanting to like probably tax the rich which like i don't even genuinely believe he wants to do because i know how right-wing populism works like oh you say all these things blah 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 and then you get in power and you get donald trump you know it's to do with it close. first I think it's important to clarify what the mission of the show is since Nathan sort of seems to mischaracterize what we're doing here in the first place. We're not pretending that we agree on everything. Yeah, I'm doing this at 1.25. I, I can't stand it. I usually watch it in two. You guys are going to have to endure. Everything and joining hands and singing Kumbaya. If you've been watching the show, especially in recent weeks, you know Sagar and I have deep, profound, and sometimes tense disagreements on the path forward in this country. I bet you've been having some of those ugly disagreements with your own friends and own family. So if the question is, hey. Yes, and one of her disagreements, which we're going to get into, is his ridiculous opinion on immigration as one freaking topic, where he's just straight up lying for like, I, I think I think it's like five or eight minutes, and they eventually go like, okay, let's just end this, because like, they're at each other's throats, because like, Sagar is lying about data, and like, preaching some like, ethno-nationalist garbage, and she's just like, you're lying about everything, and it's like, yes. Should leftists just wholesale accept right-wing populism as an ideology? Of course the answer is no, but then, literally no one is arguing that. Instead, the project of the show is pretty simple. There are two major ideologies rising in America right now. What are they? What's fueling them? Where are the intersections and where are the disagreements? Frankly, during the Democratic primary, those intersections were more on display. There was a shared view of media treatment of anti-establishment candidates and of the supporters that were backing them, of the core rot in America, which has fed populist discontent, of the way that corporate interests stand in the way of pro-worker economic policies like Medicare for All. There was also a close alignment in the coronavirus economic response as both parties completely fell on their face, propping up corporations while leaving small businesses and... Okay, like, this this equation here on, like, this is, a, I guess, a small tangent. Like, saying that both parties did the same nonsense for, like, the coronavirus response is partially correct. Um, so you have the Republican-controlled Senate, the Republican-controlled executive branch, and then the Democrats just control uh, the House of Representatives. Nancy Pelosi, I think, from what I remember, um, I really don't like talking about stuff while we're still experiencing it, but I, I feel pretty confident saying this. Someone can feel... Call me out if I'm wrong on it. Nancy Pelosi worked with Steve Mnuchin, who's uh, Secretary of... How can I remember this? He's... Whatever. He's in Trump's cabinet, and he deals with, like, economy-related stuff. So they worked out their stimulus plan, where they're fighting between, like, wanting corporate interests and, and, like, to what degree they're going to help out that and help out, like, the middle class. And the whole point of doing this is so that when they bring something to the House and the Senate that it can get passed quickly, and that Trump's not going to veto any nonsense. Now, Nancy Pelosi sucks, okay? She ain't great, but she is going to be arguing from position to the left of, like, Steve Mnuchin. So when they're reaching these these agreements, it's being pulled between her being centrist garbage and um, uh, centrist Democratic uh, garbage, who's, in, who's beholden to corporate interests, and Mnuchin, who's just beholden to corporate interests and, like, right-wing working for, like, uh, a demagogue like Trump, like, that that's what you're dealing with so there were there were democrats who were like hey you're screwing us and like this isn't right and they try and insert better language into the bill try and fight for more things there's the famous like bernie sanders uh 
getting onto the floor of the Senate and saying, like, I'm going to, like, not let us pass this bill if we don't put the $600, um, uh, what's it called, like, supplement on top of unemployment insurance payment because this is ridiculous. You guys are being monsters. And it was a bunch of, I can't remember exactly who, I think it was, like, three conservatives were, like, uh, Republicans were trying to block the bill because they're like, oh, we're just giving stuff away to the poor people. I mean, while, like, obviously we know what she's saying about the giveaway of the rich is accurate, but there were Democrats fighting for it. Don't both sides this shit because it ain't both sides. Both sides suck, but one side sucks ten times motherfucking more. And you should focus on the side that sucks ten times motherfucking more and not just equate them as equally bad because that's ridiculous and it's dishonest. Come the on. working class to wither on the vine. But in recent weeks, the differences have very much been on display. You know, we profoundly disagree on the nature of the protests, on structural racism, on policing, on the use of force by law enforcement, and maybe most of all, on deploying the military to quell protests. I won't lie, it has been extremely uncomfortable. It's easy to argue about these things in carefully composed tweets sent into an audience of your ideological brethren. It's harder to engage with them in real time, face to face, without the benefit of a straw man. I've grappled these past weeks myself with the tenability of exactly what we're attempting to do. After all, there is a reason why no one else is doing it. It's not easy. But ultimately, once I calm down, I just fundamentally don't believe the left benefits from isolation, deplatforming, and a refusal to engage. In fact, on this show, I've seen quite the opposite. Let's take as an example probably the most fraught issue over the past few weeks, which has been Trump's threat to invoke the Insurrection Act. Now, okay, like saying that right-wing populism results in fascism and that he's palling, like, like Sagar and Jetty, like regularly talks, like says like great stuff about fucking Tucker Carlson. It is no secret to crystal ball or to like anyone with half a fucking brain that tucker carlson is openly like spreading like white nationalist talking points like it's go watch his show for like any like random 10 minute segment i'm sure you'd find him saying something completely obscene to like dehumanize immigrants or or like paint this thing and yes he does do like the whole popular shtick but that's why he's on soccer and jetty's side but like this comes at the expense of antagonization or sorry antagonization um antagon and uh, antagonism oh whatever antagonizing against immigrant groups against people who have no power in this country but we're going to put in detention camps by the way still happening never stopped happening we're still doing it we just stopped talking about it like they're going to advocate for stuff like that and defend it because they're monsters um but it's like yes y you you can talk shit about these people it's okay I'll never judge you for it's it. It's not easy. But ultimately, once I calm down, I just fundamentally don't believe the left benefits from isolation, deplatforming, and a refusal to engage. In fact, on this show... You can engage, but you don't act like they are good people. You can do both of these. I know I do agree that the left, I think, does do too much deplatforming, doesn't want to engage, but I understand it's very hard to engage responsibly with right-wing people because they're just engaging in talking points and stuff that has like a rhetorical like whip to it and they're just there to try and own you like you could like see anything ben shapiro says about like how to debate the left and it's all just about making you look stupid there's no actual good faith effort to have a conversation so in that respect i'd say either talk to talk to a conservative or republican when you're prepared when you know what's going on i mean obviously this isn't like a formalized environment um, and just make sure, like, you know what you're... That's why these idiots, like, go and debate people on college campuses, Stephen Crowder, Ben Shapiro. That's why they talk to people who don't have any formal education or ability to, like, really meaningfully defend themselves because that is their... That is who they know they can beat up. They don't want a worthy adversary. They want to preach. They're just preaching, like, something equivalent to, like, a religion. But we'll get into that another time on a video on fascism, but whatever. Oh, I've seen quite... But, like engaging with them responsibly and not engaging with them are, are different things and what you're doing playing apologetics for them is like miles beyond just saying like oh like deplatforming them like no you should trash this guy and when he gets called out for his like xenophobic fascist opinions or like fascist tendencies i should say um in in Sagar, like let him defend himself or 25% through this fucking video and he hasn't opened this stupid fucking The opposite. Yet. Let's take as an example probably the most fraught issue over the past few weeks, which has been Trump's threat to invoke the Insurrection Act. Now, I do believe such a deployment of the active duty military... I can see that this says crystal ball response to our critics, but I don't think he has one too. Terry ...against protesters would be a terrifying move towards authoritarianism and, yes, towards fascism. I made that case explicitly on the show and we debated it here fiercely. I wish that was a view that was out... Why is that a debate we're having? Why are you and a fellow populist who's supposed to care about the people debating on if we should use the police 
to I mean I haven't watched a specific video the fact you said they had a fierce debate on their channel about it is ridiculous to me you're going to use the police and use military force to like suppress protesters exercising their free speech that's not okay I wouldn't have supported it against those morons in Wisconsin who had their guns and wanted to go to nail salons and whatever other dumb stuff they wanted to do I'll give a more subtle take on that some other time um, because I don't want to like fully paint them in that way but whatever um but yeah, like, I don't support violence against them, although I would say they were probably deserving of just as much, if not more, versus the police response we got for the uh, BLM protests following the death of, uh, man, I'm so tired. Uh, I can't remember his name right now. Jesus Christ. Wow, I'm, I'm going to look it up. Black, <laughs> dude. George, George Floyd. Okay, there we go. Oof. Took me a second. Um, yeah, like... You shouldn't need to debate about this. Most of these protests are overwhelmingly peaceful, and the ones that do get violent, like, okay, I, I guess the state does have some sort of responsibility to act in this respect, but in many cases, the state is antagonizing these protesters and going out there and using excessive force, and the protesters respond, and then violence breaks out. A huge portion of this is the state, who is an organized body, needs to have more calculated, more responsible um, responses to this stuff. And the huge reason there's violence like breaking out is because the state is not being responsible. You have cops who are going out there in full riot gear, just shooting tear gas at, at like protesters. I, I, you can go through any of the number of compilations of them doing clearly messed up stuff. Now, am I saying it's always them instigating? No, there's a, there's a both sides element to this. But like, you have one side which is an unorganized group of protesters who are angry and upset, and the other side are supposed to be the police who are an arm of the state who are organized, have a central hierarchy, have a have a have a command system, and are supposed to show self control underneath pressure, of which they are doing none of. Like, it's ridiculous side of mainstream acceptability but like how can you argue you're fighting on behalf of the people if like you're having a spirited debate about like should we shoot protesters in the knee like it's clearly stupid beyond the pale so to speak but we have to acknowledge that it's not when the president is advocating for military deployment and a sizable chunk of the population is in support of it i believe engagement is more effective than like what does sizable chunk here mean like you could poll people on like should we eat other human beings? And like that poll would probably have like an eight, a five, like a three to eight percent yes. Like when we, when you, when you pull that, like I don't know the exact um, statistics on it, but like I know that there's a very high amount of support for the protests themselves, and I imagine there's also not a huge amount of support for like rolling out the military to deal with these people. Now, if I had a guess, I'd say it's probably somewhere in the area of thirty percent. Obviously, not that three to eight percent. But I'm saying is like that's not a very sizable pop chunk of the population like it's just not like i mean at most i'd say it's probably like 38 percent comparable to trump's approval rating bearing your head in the sand that's different from saying that every crank or fringe view deserves a hearing and it can be hard to know where to draw that line but in general when a view is held by powerful leaders and a large portion of the country i believe direct engagement is a more effective strategy than shunning and we've seen the proof of that here because we actually have to deal with each other as human so it's both um you should directly engage with, with what they're saying whether it's you having a debate with someone you disagree with in a position of influence like Crystal, or if it's just not platforming people who are doing bad things, like Trump getting banned off Twitter, like, fine, whatever. He's out there, like, inciting violence and, like, using it as a medium in which to, like, spread propaganda. Sure, ban him off Twitter. Like, I have no problem with that. Like, whatever. Well, I could see, like, larger arguments for that, but I'm just saying, like, in, in, in the short term, sure, like, whatever. You want to do that? You want to, like, deplatform people who are just spreading misinformation? I think it's important to deal with things, but also use, like, tools that you have in which to stop the spread of nonsense. Like, it ain't... It ain't, it ain't human beings and can't just caricature and straw man the other side is uniquely evil we've both heard from quite a number of viewers about being de-radicalized viewers who have now placed their okay so here's the thing they're not uniquely evil just like um fascism and nazis or sorry uh, uh mussolini and hitler and nazism and uh, italian fascism um these things weren't unique like they're variants of one another and fascism has cropped up like all or uh, cropped up has popped up all around the world like in multiple instances in multiple places and this isn't a unique phenomenon and it's never uniquely evil it's just it's a thing it's a phenomenon it is bad and we should call it bad and we should be antagonistic towards it and we should be unaccepting of it but it's bad it doesn't need to be uniquely evil to be bad i don't know why she's being ridiculous. anger at the structures leaders and institutions which have screwed over ordinary americans rather than at their fellow americans themselves Viewers who've been able to have conversations with family members again about politics. 
If your political project involves uniting a multiracial working class coalition around social democracy, that is incredibly important and very heartening to hear. By the way, I also think we should be pretty humble about the virtue of our own side versus the other side. It's not clear to me why Sagar should be beyond the pale, but the corporate imperialist Democrats who sold out the country and murdered civilians overseas should be just fine. They're not just fine. They should get shit on. Sagar should also get shit on. They should both be shit on. If you want to talk about Joe Biden signing up and, and like championing in the Iraq, not just like, I don't. Uh, okay, this is uh, I'll caveat this one. I'm 100. I'm pretty sure he was one of like the vocal supporters of like the Iraq War uh, for the Democratic side, because um, he's always been like one of the more conservative members of the Democratic Party. Um, but like, yes, you can shit on them, and I can also shit on right wing populists. But like, guess what? The the shitty people like Joe Biden, they're not gonna try. They're not gonna get all hot and bothered when the Supreme Court says like, yeah, you can't discriminate against by uh, LGBT people. They're not going to get mad when, like, there's, like, the DACA ruling that, like, says you can't remove DACA. Uh, and they're not going to push for these things. So, like, yes, I'm going to hate them less because, like, um, while right-wing populists, it'd be tough to say whether or not they would, like, this talk for another video, but, like, right-wing populism's uh, aggression that it's founded upon, it's mobilizing energy, is that of anger and hate. And that needs an outlet and it starts with like these internal populations and its end result is usually an ex a war of external aggression so yeah it would eventually end in that am i going to say it would necessarily be the iraq war or the afghanistan like i don't know like i can't i can't say that claim that's 20 years ago like i can't say for, for certain but like to act like they would never do this or like oh they're more beyond the pale because of these things like no they both suck and you say they both suck i don't try and make uh or or um, what's it called? Break bread with like corporate fucking Democrats. People are like, oh, we should invade Iraq. Like, fuck you, you're wrong. Um, but like, I would probably agree with them more than I would agree with like a fucking fascist or fascist sympathizer in Sagar and Jetty. Like, Finally, Nathan readily admits that he agrees with 80% of what Sagar says. <laughs> Many of the leftists who watch- Okay, I'm pausing way too much here. I'm going full Sam Cedar. Most of what Sagar says, one, I think he even clarifies it in that thing. Like, it's disingenuous. Fascists lie. He can say all this nonsense, and, like, I don't believe that you'd actually follow through on half of it. I don't... Like, if you're going to defend hierarchies and you're going to, like, attack the rich, like, I don't think you actually have a problem with there being a ruling class. You just don't like certain things you see this ruling class doing. Like, I don't know. I don't know if Walmart actually did this, but, like, like uh, let's say, like, a company that needs immigrants, like, using their substantial wealth to support, like, pro-immigrant policy or something like that. Like... Yeah, if you have a problem with that, sure. But you, but you don't. Um, wait, I just said that. I just broke that. So like, yeah, they might have a problem with that, but that's like the stupidest thing to hate these people about. Cause like, I don't mind post integration. Um, and like, if that's the only thing you're against them doing, like, well, I don't think we hate the rich people for the same reasons. Um, because yours are, I, I, I want less like different looking people here, and mine are like they should stop doing this to like drive down wages and fight unions and all this stuff it's just like you don't even hate them for the same reason so it's like whatever and like in their world these people the one the bill the billionaires who agree with them would be propped up and the ones who disagree with them would just be destroyed or that work um yeah the, the billionaires who agree with them would just be in positions of power and influence and the ones who disagree with them are the ones who would get hurt but that's not getting rid of billionaires it's just having the ones who agree with you in power like <laughs> doesn't change anything watch the show probably feel the same way now that is partly because we do tend to gravitate towards topics where we have some level of shared interest and agreement but it's also partly because oh also i meant to say it's like Sagar just does like almost everything he does is just bashing corporate democrats like yes populist left-leaning people are going to agree with that because it aligns with bernie sanders rhetoric but like i said what he's bashing them for is like a completely different reason that you're bashing them for it's just that he doesn't go deep on it so like you don't really realize like oh the reason you hate like billionaires is because you think a portion of them are like supporting immigrants and you don't like immigrants blah, blah, blah. Like, there are a number of things on which we do in fact agree so one of the central questions of this show is on those areas of overlap can the new left and the new right work together should they and that is in fact the question that i put to nathan and others who view the world as he does if you have a republican who's willing to work with you on a living wage but they're an immigration restrictionist do you work with that person? If you've got a Trumpist who will stand with you on... Yes, you work with them 
on that one specific thing and deny them the other part of it. And you shit talk them on the other part of it. Am I saying like in that same bill, you just tell them how much you hate them while you're signing a thing together? Like probably not. But like you don't have a TV show with them where you do so far six minutes of apologetics defending like him being terrible. Union rights, but calls coronavirus the Wuhan virus. Do you still collaborate? If they will help you fight for a UBI during a pandemic, but they support using the Insurrection Act, what do you do? Now, my answer is the same as Bernie's. When he worked with Ron Paul on surveillance or worked with John McCain to support veterans or worked with Mike Lee to end our backing of the war in Yemen. I think you take yes for an answer when it's given and retort hell no when you don't agree. I remember Bernie Sanders having like a 15 minute defense of like Mike Lee and his like xenophobia or Ron Paul and his like bigotry in his previous articles and how like that's just something you need to accept to work with them or when ron paul was like we need to audit the fed because like the new world order and getting on into all his rampant conspiracism and like trying to repeal all taxes and whatever other insane shit ron paul wanted to do spoiler i'm joking he never did that he worked on them on this one bill for this one specific thing and worked with them to achieve that ends and then didn't just play defense and pretend like, oh, they're really great guys and we should respect their opinions on things because like, you know, they probably have something valuable to contribute. Like, no, libertarians are insane. They don't have really interesting or valuable fucking insights to give you. They just coincidentally like, you know, a broken clock is right twice a day. Libertarian doesn't want to go to war. Congrats. That broken clock was right. But not because he's fundamentally has something of value that like drive or sorry. Um, he has some like fundamentally good moral system that like drives their decision making. It's just like, oh, your thing managed to get here. Like same way like Nazis, like you can find like some Nazis who support universal health care. Usually just only for white people, I guess. But it's just stupid. We're going to defend Nazis because some of them support health care. Like, I think rather than retreating to your ideological corner of imagined moral purity, you engage with the world as it exists in all of its messy ugliness because that's reality. Now, I'm not claiming I navigate these things perfectly. Of course I don't. I always want to do better and try to live up. To, to clarify on that, I am totally fine with political pragmatism. Bernie Sanders voting for like the ACA because like it was a it was a tangible improvement for the lives of like 30 actually more than 30 it put 30 million more people on insurance and improved the quality of insurance for those who were already insured was that ideologically pure no but sometimes you just make compromises because your end goal is to improve the material conditions of people in your society people in your country people who you are you are obligated to work for that's what he did I'm fine with that but like that's not the same thing of the trust that you all have placed in us but for those who believe that the core project of this show is rotten from the jump not only do i disagree but i believe that way of thinking does profound damage to making actual progress on a social democratic agenda for the multiracial working class because the moment that you character everyone who calls themselves populist right as hitler no one's going to listen to a so not every single one of people on the populist right are going to genocide six million fucking Jews, okay? Like, these Trumpian fascists, like, they're too dumb. Like, for all Hitler's, like, they were dumb, they were delusional, and they had, like, their, their crazy, like, ideology. Trump and his sycophants are, like, too incompetent to pull something like that off. But, like, that's not saying, like, I don't think they would try, right? Like, he talked about, like, want to... <laughs> like shooting uh, people crossing the border and like the legs and all this shit, like doing the ice raids that are like all over our country. And there's plenty of stuff they're doing that are monstrous, but like not everything has to be just as bad as Hitler. And I don't think it's a fair characterization to say that just because you say like, hey, you're doing right-wing populism, right-wing populism is basically fascism. Like, yeah, but there are degrees of fascism. Like you could read any fucking history book on like fascism by like uh, Roger Griffin. Uh, Rob Wait, I, I messed that up. So there's Paxton and Griffin, who I've read, um, and Echo, but Echo's more just like an essay, but whatever. Like, you could read those things, and they explain to you, like, yeah, there's phases of fascism that, like, don't always manifest in the same way. They have general trends, and, like, some societies fail before, they fail in different stages, blah, 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 blah. And, like, I think it's Paxton who outlines, like, seven different stages of, like, a, like, a, like, like fascist movements, like, go through. And it's like, yeah, but guess what? At stage one or stage seven, if you're doing fascism, it's just to what degree are you doing fascism? Like, that's all it is. But it's still fascism. So, like, maybe Trump's at, like, a stage three or four, and, like, Hitler was clearly at a seven. Mussolini at a seven. But, like, that doesn't mean, like, oh, you can't call Trump a fascism. It's like, what? Am I going to wait until he's, like, th like, like, okay, guys, let's take out the Zyklon B and kill all the, Jew kill all the Muslims? Like, no, I'm not going to wait till that. You speak up before that. So you don't get to that. Like, this is ridiculous. Another word you have to say, nor should they.
And Sagar, look, Nathan wrote this piece, yeah. right? And I was like, ah, what do we do with it? Like, do I say? Do I just let it go? Well, what do we do? Well, free for him. But yeah. I do, this is a critique we've heard before. Sure. And so I think it's worth laying out, like, what is it we're doing here? <laughs> it's really quite conditions rising in America. You can either deal with that or you yeah. can try to ignore it and isolate yourself increasingly into these ideological corners. And I just think that is fundamentally the wrong well, approach. Of the American right who are hearing an anti-corporate agenda. All right. I want to hear Sagar's Sager, nonsense right now. Um, I'll go over the next one because I stopped too much in this video. And I'll... We'll do, we'll do the other one pretty quick here. So I went over this in the previous video. Uh, we'll do this. But it's not for American workers. While healthcare is the number for illegal immigration without congressionally codified protection in law, rightfully should be viewed as a moral disaster for American workers. While healthcare is the number one issue, it shows a lack of real care for the American working class. And it lacks recognition that the majority of people in America want less immigration. Healthcare may so he says majority of people in, in, in the United States don't want more immigration. Uses this poll that doesn't say what he says. It's just most important issue. And then it's more important now. But like I got into this in the other video. Like this doesn't support what he's saying. You can go to plenty of other polls by like Pew and whatever that show like, yeah, most people are supportive of immigration. Like sure, there's been more partisan divides. But like the, the divide is still leaning towards being positive on immigration. We've had a steadily improving view of immigration, even if that partisan divide has increased. Maybe the number like, one issue as an average, in the Democratic say. primary. But it's not the number one issue in a general election. Bernie's alliance with the worst elements of his coalition are going to lose him the election. And if he wants to empower them, then I think he does deserve to lose. And I'm actually curious for your response on that, Crystal, because I don't know why he would put all of these executive orders on day one. When Look, I actually believe him whenever he says that his solution for illegal immigration is to give every worker in this country 50... Actually, I just feel this is going to have very little debunking, because, like, Crystal Ball does a great job saying everywhere he's fucking wrong, where, like, not only is he wrong, he has to be actively fucking lying. Keep in mind, he said that last thing and then pulled up a completely unrelated graphic. I don't know where in post they fucking did that. I don't know what degree he's responsible for it. But, like, in post, they edited that shit in. They showed that ridiculous graph. Well, I assume it was in post. I mean, I think this show's pre-recorded. I don't think they do it live. But, like, yeah. You're like, I made this point, and, like, here's some random data I can use to hopefully bolster my point, even though, like, you can just read the fucking graph and it's clearly not saying, like, what he showed you is clearly not saying. You don't even have to dig in. Like, I didn't even have to, like, go look up, like, oh, let's go dig into this YouGov poll or whatever the hell it was. Like, no, you, you just gave me the thing showing that you don't have the evidence you're saying. $15 per hour minimum wage in order to stop wage arbitrage that happens. Again, I don't agree with it. I think it's perfectly sound as a response. But that's not going to be a day one priority for him. And this is a day one priority for him. And that's my greatest concern, which is that President Reagan gave every 3 million people amnesty and promised a bunch of enforcement. The enforcement stuff never came. The amnesty did. And now they all live here. And that's essentially what ended up happening. And wages went, you know, plummeting down to the ground. Well, let's just dispel with one myth, which is that the problem for... I'm, like, so tempted to fact check the whole Reagan amnesty thing. I know they weren't as crazy against, like, people from South Central America, like, back then. That, like, rabid nature sort of, like, arose in, like, the early 2000s. Like, alongside, like, the whole terrorism scare for whatever reason. But, like, I don't really care if they cracked down on... For like, we never, like, reformed our immigration system to, like, let more people in. I wouldn't necessarily be surprised with that characterization, though. Because, like, you can go back and, like... Like, I would support, like, fucking Nixon at a policy level, like support like health care and like all this other shit over like obama i mean like ignoring the whole like dog whistling and uh, obviously it's complicated but certain policies nixon proposed you'd be like well that sounds super liberal like i totally vote for that guy and then if i showed you like who it was it's like oh shit that was nixon american workers Specifically, I was thinking healthcare and his environmental policies. Is immigrants. Well, no, it's, it's certain, not. It's problem. not. And that's, that's, the, that's the problem. So, so yeah. you've laid out, this yeah. is why you could never support, you know, a mm -hmm. leftist like Bernie Sanders. The reason why I could never support the right-wing nationalism is mm -hmm. because it always just collapses down to, it's their fault. She hit the nail on the head. That's fascism. Us versus them. And then you just blame a random immigrant group. And guess what? If you successfully ex excise or disempower that immigrant group, do you think they go, oh, you know what? Our problem still exists. I guess we were wrong. No, they don't. They say, what's the next group I can blame? It's like a last out, or like, what's it called? It's a, it's a, what's it called? First fired, or wait, last hired, first, wait. Last hired, first fired, but just like, for whom I hate. Like, that's all it is. If we got rid of, like, Hispanics now, oh, like, they'd start, well, they already go in on black people, but, like, if they got rid of Hispanics, they would start, like, trying to, like, fuck with black people more. And then if they ever got rid of that, then they would go probably to, like, mess with, uh, let's see, you got Jews, you got Asians. Um, yeah, it would probably be Asians after that. Um, and then, like, you know, I'm Italian and Irish. I would be next. You know, we were the we were the N-words, uh, the, the white N-words or whatever they called us, or Irish N-words. I don't remember. But, um, like, yeah, it would just keep going backwards, and their problems would just never get solved because, like, they're stupid, and they don't actually have mechanisms to solve problems. 
So what do we have in the Trump administration? The rhetoric of it's there, it's the immigrants' fault. It's their fault that your wages are low. Meanwhile, giving the store away to the plutocrats like they've been doing well, for, both for fault, decades, right? right? It's not both's fault. He is wrong. There is tons of studies on this, which Crystal Ball will mention, that like you could do like the the Oh, what's it, the Mariana, Marielle boat lift in Cuba, which was like a huge fucking study that was done multiple times, where like there were some wages of like very low income, like white uh, native, native populations who like didn't get a high school education. Their wages, I think, remained relatively stagnant, but like everyone else in those areas improved. He is just lying. Right, so, so this is the, the uh, fundamental. So I think you're wrong both on the policy and on the policy. What is he even fucking writing down right now? This cannot possibly be anything interesting. He's just trying to like look like he's pensive and thoughtful, and he's really just like, what's the next thing I can fucking lie about? Politics on the politics. There is massive support for comprehensive. I would pay twenty dollars to see what that what's all written on that piece of paper. It's probably just like a fucking doodle of like a swastika. Of immigration reform. Totally. That's a reality, yeah, they want right? Less overall they want a path to citizenship. No, that doesn't mean we just open the borders, mm -hmm. right? You should know who is coming into your country. That's a, you know, that's absolutely the view of myself, of Bernie Sanders, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But you can't have people who are getting paid under the table because that is is a problem for American right. workers. If you can pay someone, you know, five bucks an hour, no taxes, and you have to pay an American worker fifteen dollars an hour or seven twenty five at least at this point, and have labor protections, et cetera, that is the disaster for American right. workers. There's simply no evidence that increased low skill immigration actually is a detrimental effect to native born workers. Now, at the high end, mm -hmm. I think the high-skilled workers, that does depress Especially wages both, for high-skilled workers. I don't really particularly care about that, <laughs> but there is no evidence that low-skilled immigration right. actually harms workers. So I think you're wrong on mm -hmm. the politics, and I think you're wrong on the policy. And this is the fundamental divide, though, between the type of nationalism that mm -hmm. you support and the type of democratic socialism that Sanders and I support. I think the difference, though, is, well, A, there is evidence <laughs> of low-skilled workers do depress wages. but No, there's not. You are lying, Saka. You are lying. Because you are a liar, because there's no evidence to support you. I wish we could throw out that graphic right now. I wonder what he would show. I wonder what he would show. He's like, oh, look at this. Look at this. Look at this one McDonald's in rural Wisconsin. The, the wages went down when Hispanic people worked there. Like, I, don't, I can't even imagine what evidence he would like scrounge up for the that. real thing is is i actually agree about the plutocrats i don't blame immigrants or low-skilled people for wanting to come here and make a higher wage than they make back in their home yeah. i don't blame them whatsoever any rational person would do that i blame big corporations in alliance with government who want that's the thing i agree it's the plutocrats who does low wages work for better than anyone else it doesn't work for americans it doesn't work even for the immigrants themselves who are often taken advantage of by these companies it works for the benefit of tyson's foods of the big agricultural companies of all these people i do not blame immigrants and you know what if you talk to the non-racist people who want illegal uh, immigration restriction in this country that's what it all comes down to it's about corporations who are exploiting actually immigrant workers and American yes, workers sure. to the detriment of everybody then because we can have lower prices. Down on those corporations. Both. But the other piece that I hear coming from the yeah. right is a lot of hand-wringing about our demographics and how there aren't enough young people and all of that. I almost guarantee you if I like search long and hard enough, I could find him talking about like, well, we need to make sure there's proper integration and like, you know, we they, they value like American culture, like our democracy. And like, I'm sure I could see like ridiculous shit of him going off on that where he's like, oh, I don't talk about demographics. But then you just talk about stuff like that that acts as like just a freaking uh, what's it called? Um, just a proxy for like the thing that you don't want to say because it's transparently racist. Um what was she saying there? And American yes. work. He's yes, once again, he just keeps trying to say, yeah, it hurts both. It's like, no. It, like, the whole, like, libertarian, like, a rising tide lifts all boats. Like, they're lying in terms of tax policies. That's usually how they present it. But in terms of immigration, it literally does. It's one of the only things these corporations do to help people. But we can have that immigration, and we can make it legal. We can make it so people are on the books, and you can increase minimum wages. Like, so people are getting paid equitable amounts of money for the work they put in. You can do that, and you can also re-empower unions, so, like, you don't need to keep, like, managing people's, like, wages to, like, a minimum wage eventually. Like, there's so many things you could fucking do that don't involve, like, we need to restrict all the immigrants. Which is, like, his go-to, because he's insane. Of all these people, I do not blame immigrants. And you know what? If you talk to the non-racist people who want illegal uh, immigration restriction in this country, that's what it all comes down to. It's about corporations who are exploiting, actually, immigrant workers and American yeah. workers. Sure. Look at Sager, just caring about the well-being of immigrant workers. Love it. To the detriment of everybody because we can have lower like like i just like it's transparent that he doesn't actually care about him he goes well they they lower wages but you're lying they, one they don't and if they do it's probably in some very negligible way in a very like specific niche like i kind of talk about the mario boatlift studies but it's that's niche it's the exception not the rule in overall it helps everybody so like why are you pretending you care about their well-being if like okay, like, there could be some small offset. And here's the thing, like, I'm not okay with those people necessarily getting hurt. I'd support a well-funded welfare state where, like, people who do get hurt by, like, certain immigration policies, we can, um, 
you know, have education programs, you could have early retirement programs. So like, let's say like you were like a, I don't know, like a coal worker and we decide like, okay, we're going to green energy. You don't have a job. This dude was like 53 or whatever. Cool. Give him, let him retire 10, 12 years early. Like what, what do I care? Do it. it that's the right thing to do by those people. If they, if they can't get trained, they don't want to like whatever it is, let them retire early. That's okay, man. Get another job, you know, pursue their hobbies, like whatever, you know, let them engage in, with their community fuck there's so many things you could do there but like the answer is not like just don't do any of it like that's why i just literally can't believe that like he is pretending to care well no i can't believe he's pretending pretending to care about this but like we know he doesn't on this corporation but the other piece that i hear coming from the right is a lot of hand wringing about our demographics and how there aren't enough young people and all of that i'm not putting that on you but that is argument i hear coming from the right well guess what you have a whole young population that wants to come into the country that is here that you could bring out of the shadows that would actually be an asset to our country i mean look it's not exactly analogous but i was talking to a friend of yours sam hammond who was an economist for canada and he says we're trying like we need more population that's an asset for us we have this mentality it's a mythology of scarcity in this country it's one of the reasons i love andrew yang's campaign is because it is centered around getting rid of this mythology of scarcity, the idea that there isn't enough for everybody to have health care, for immigrants to be able to come in in reasonable numbers and have access to health care and public education and contribute to society. I think that is the biggest myth and the biggest um, tool of social control that is weaponized in this country. And that's what I see the right doing. Rather than dealing with, I'm not putting this on sure. you, I'm putting this on, you know, the Trump administration as the current example. Rather than actually dealing with the structural issues of the economy, it's so much easier to just say it's their fault. So the way I look. Once again, I don't really even need to add to that. She's 100% right. But why? Are you defending this guy for, what was it, eight fucking minutes we were at in this video? Eight, eight of, like, 13 minutes you're defending Sagar and, like, these fucking nationalists who, like, that's who they're trashing? Like, that's who you're defending, though. Look, she even gets complimented in this. I didn't even see this before, but it's what I'm exactly honed in on. I'm especially pressed by the town of Crystal Walls. It emerges one of the sharpest and most valuable commentaries on the contemporary left. It links to a Jacobin thing. Um... She's smart, selfish, fearless, and I like the work she does. She's doing great here. This is wonderful. But, like, here you go in defense of a fucking idiot who's lying. Like, wh wh why? Okay, so, I, I, I it has been characterized as it's their fault. But, and, and you know what? I'll blame the Trump administration for not making this case accurately. Like, don't give him undue credibility. Don't give right wing populism undue credibility. They don't deserve it. <laughs> like, if you coincidentally agree, cool, we're going to pause together. Don't pretend, like, well, we need to hear their concerns. Because, like, well, I can acknowledge certain right-wing con populist concerns are genuine, like lower wages, you know, um, less like time to spend with their family, and like having those like conservative values they feel are eroded, right? Like having like the man as the single breadwinner, and like now our economy is like, well, we need to both of you got to work now, so you can't have that. I'm not saying we should have that. I'm just saying that's an option that these people had in like the 50s and 60s that they don't have now, and that they're bothered by, and that is why they say like, hey, like I agree, like blah blah blah, and like what people like soccer do is say well it's actually the fault of immigrants that like we you can't have like a single person income they're driving down wages but like once again we know that's not true you are lying but like i feel like you should be able to support a family on a single person income but like not require it obviously like if you and your spouse both want to work you should both make the same amount of money and um figure out well same amount of money for doing the same work or whatever um and then you just have twice the income. But I don't think just that one income should, like, preclude people from being able to, like, live above the poverty line. You know, like, we could, we can live in that world. It is possible. Because they instead but, like, decided to sorry, ally them. My point in that is, like, the right-wing gripes that lead them to this, like, ridiculous, like, fascist ideologies isn't – their gripes aren't wrong. It's just the conclusions that they are drawn to are not only wrong but damaging to what they actually want to accomplish, right? By having immigrants, as an example, you have an increase in your tax base in a group that disproportionately doesn't really use services. The only way, the only way, sorry, the way that um, anti-immigrant people like inflate their uh, the cost of immigrants on the welfare system is by talking about educational costs, which are an investment in your future that we do for any given population. So that's like disingenuous because that's not really a welfare. It's like like a welfare would be like if you're giving them food stamps or something, um, not if like you're sending them to school to learn and then be a contributing member of your society like that's just insane like clearly stupid themselves with big business and make the economic case that i'm talking about which is that the greatest criminals are the ones who want to depress wages for immigrants and for american workers but on that case about the see they're the greatest criminals but 
The other ones, still criminals. Lower, the younger people that want to come here. I do. Like, it's like one of the only decent things that businesses, like, had done at certain points where it's just to drive, like, certain types of immigration that, like, improves the lives of these people and helps the people in the native country. One of the few, like, somewhat good things, obviously, like, their motivations are not pure. It's just, like, the result of it is, like, eh, I guess we all kind of end up okay. But, like, that's what he's opposed to, the good part think it is actually immoral to a worker to say that we are abandoning you in favor of bringing in people in order to overall increase our population She's the way i look at it is right that now. we should you can see it in her face i don't remember what her reaction to this is but i like that framing that we're abandoning the workers by bringing in these people like no and that's nothing she ever supported and he knows she doesn't support this he is just making shit up again make it so that all workers should be incentivized to have kids if listen if they want to they should be able to have as many kids as possible so for me moves. that whenever the great crime is making it and making cost of living so high that moms and dads have to decide between having another kid or not having another kid people should be able to have as many kids as they want in this country and do and, and still have a healthy <laughs> economic life and here's what I, here's what i will say yeah. is that and i hear this a lot from from working class mm -hmm. you're, you're right about this that you know we like i can't even i can't even get health care exactly. right like i don't even have the wages i need to survive how can you be letting all these people in and giving them health you know there's a lot of mythology around like immigrants and all the like you know the welfare there's like a welfare queen thing going on with immigrants mm -hmm. which is totally phony and not true but i do think it is legitimate to say when i can't even get health care why are we worrying about these people but under sanders administration i'm sad she didn't go in the way i thought she was about to but like his framing was ridiculous there and she's still correcting him here but not in the way of like yo you're being over the top here, buddy. The whole idea is no, everyone has health care. And right. I think that is the fundamental political philosophy is getting rid of this idea of scarcity, having fundamental economic rights for all, including immigrants, including mm -hmm. refugees who are welcoming into the nation. And that that is that that universality is to the benefit. The problem of I have is actually the political order of operations. I don't doubt his motives. I really do appreciate, appreciate all the stuff with good faith. It's that the order of operations is such in American politics, as we all know, is that when you have these types of things, you end ice raids, all this, look, immigration, comprehensive immigration reform. If that was going to happen in Sanders administration, it'd be or number three or four for his priority, right? Mm -hmm. Medicare for all has to come one. Well, in that three and four, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people, which is already happening right now, who are entering the United States. And under a Sanders administration, all of them would get to stay, all of them would get health care, all of them would have access to public services, and then we're supposed to legalize all these people. I think that is an immoral case for workers and for wage arbitrage. How do you make the argument that that is immoral? <laughs> It benefits the people living in the country, it benefits the people coming to the country, it increases the tax base, makes us more productive. But it's immoral because we're going to give, we're going to let, not let sick people die, like, like he once again he's just doubling down on the things that he's already been told he's wrong on but he doesn't care he's wrong and he's not going to change his opinion here because you can only do one really big thing in America. If he wants to give everybody health care, you know what? I, we can have that discussion. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's about the order of operations. And again, with amnesty, the easiest thing in the world. This is what happened with TPS. TPS was never supposed to be a long-term thing. Now half these people have been here for like 35 years because of like an earthquake in Ecuador. And it's like, which we're only supposed to temporarily be here. It's easy to let people in. The harder part is figuring out how do we deal with it from a public society, from a wage perspective. And listen, there are... I don't know what this TPS thing is. Let's look it up real quick. So um, what do you say? I was like, there's an earthquake, so I imagine it's a refugee, TPS... Um, let's say temporary protected status designated country yeah so like we let these people in to help them um this is kind of what i got from what he was he implied we let them in to help them and here's the thing refugees cost money in the short term but long term there's a benefit to them there's like a buried trump administration like survey or not survey study where they tried to demonstrate like look look how much refugees cost and they buried it because like it showed like hey refugees actually give us money but they cost money in the short term and the long term they give back to your economy. So like, yeah, if I let people in here for like 10 years and they want to stick around out or however many years, three, five, 10 years, whatever. If I let them in, give them aid for humanitarian reasons. And then like, they want to stay here and like they're economically productive. Like, I mean, yeah, sure. If they're economically productive, like welcome aboard, it's America. Enjoy your stay, you know? Like what's wrong with that? But he's like pitching this like, why are they still here? We should have sent them home. It's like, because they provide, like what? Probably for the very first time in a very long time. So what does that mean? Racists who are on the right, who want to restrict immigration only for cultural reason. I want nothing to do with those people. I hope they can rot in hell. But I do think that this is this is a fundamental divide that I don't see enough. I don't see enough even consideration of this mm. from a Sanders from Sanders and his team, and that is what really bothers me. And I think it fundamentally bothers a lot of people who, like you said, they're like, "Listen, man, I got to pay twenty thousand uh, dollars, you know, a year in daycare, and you want to give health care to illegal immigrants who just you know come across the border? That's wrong. Right. I do think it's but wrong. But that's also mythology. But I mean, but look, the true, reality right? it's not true. I mean, <laughs> immigrants who are coming across undocumented mm -hmm. are getting. Uh, this is what I like referring to as I said I wasn't going to pause and I lied. This is what I like same, you know, emergency like room health care that yes, Americans are right, right, right where you show up. Bad for everybody, exactly. So look, I think we're going to have a lot more of this. 
this conversation. Yeah. Something tells it's me good. going forward. Um, yeah, I think they're basically over, so I'm gonna pause it here. And there. Well, yeah, like she basically got it. Like, yeah, she called it a myth, but like, it's just fascist storytelling. This is like when I argue with like these morons on the internet in the past. Like, this one was really like, put out. Like, oh, okay. Let me hold on, hold on before you before you finish the explanation. Let me go get my bucket of popcorn. I'll get my nappy. I'll put my onesie on. I'll get cozy. I'll brew a cup of hot chocolate and I'll uh, I'll put some little marshmallows in it because I love fascist story time. It reminds me when my mom used to read me like Green Eggs and Ham or like Hansel and Gretel, you know, because they're made up and imaginary and have no basis in reality. I love fascist story time because that's literally what they do. They're going to weave you some ridiculous narrative that's just like fucking made up that sounds good. It's emotionally evocative of how they're taking your jibs and like whatever. And that's what it is. It's just fascist story time. It's like fucking jabronis. All right. I'm um, going to end this one here. Um, one day I'm going to have to do the, the fascism talk, which will just be a stream talking about fascism. And I'll upload the documents and the books that I eat they use to talk about it so if you guys ever want you can do your reading i also have audiobooks on most of them so maybe i'll put them in like a g drive with all that or something so if anyone wants they have access to them just don't out me to the man i want to get banned off the internet um all right cool